Hey everyone, welcome back to the top 100 for the Burger Meatball. Yes, as per my fifth anniversary, it's time for me to do another section of top 100 videos. And that means 10 videos for 10 games each, plus an aftermath video to go over my misses that didn't quite make the list. I've been doing this for a while now, it's great to see how my tastes have chopped and changed over time, which games have stayed high, which have dropped off, and I've done a few extra statistics based on designers and publishers, which I have on this hunky little sheet, which no matter what you do with Photoshop or photo editing, there's no way you're going to be able to read this, so haha, that wasn't even spoilers. So without further ado, let's get on with it. This is my 80 through 71. I've done 20 games so far, all of them I love, still 80 more to go that I equally love, just maybe with a little bit of progression as we go through. So, 80 to 71, let's crack on. As a quick heads up, we've got three new debuts and one returnee to the list. Yes, the second of the two returning items to the list. This isn't one of them though, this has only shifted down two places. It's still just as popular with me. Now, I... No, I'm not a big fan of a game called Magikoro. You know, I thought, oh yeah, this could be Catan with a little bit of a city building twist. Turned out to be pretty boring, pretty linear, completely random, like more so than even the likes of Catan can be, and it just really didn't sing to me. This game came out though, as I well, first called it Advanced Magikoro, but there's more depth to this, the expansions have helped it even more with new mechanics and just a wide variety of cards, but this is what Magikoro should have been. It is a great little game from AEG and Artipia that doesn't get enough buzz, which is sad, really. Dice City. I still really like this. It's a, a city building dice game where you have a board with five rows, I believe, five different color rows and numbers one to six. Each place on the grid has a building in it, pre-printed, and it's basic. It gets you a resource, gets you an attack bonus, gets you a coin, a victory point, whatever. And the idea is, is that you roll all your dice, all the different colors, and you place them on the board based on where the numbers and the colors match. And then each turn you can activate the buildings that the dice are on, but you can also mitigate the luck by getting rid of other dice in order to shift other dice, you know, one or two places to the left and right, etc. And certain buildings will allow you to do this too. With the resources you collect, you can either go and attack bandits for points, you can go trade resources on ships for points, or more often than not, you will be building from a trade row of buildings that you can place anywhere on your board. Doesn't matter where the color is, doesn't matter it replaces a combat building with a resource generating building, whatever. You build your city how you like. And you basically carry on each turn rolling the dice, activating them how you like, and you know, until somebody meets the criteria for finishing the game and has the most victory points. It's an unsung hero. It really does deserve a bit more buzz. I don't know why it doesn't get much buzz. I mean, it's a bit of a table hog, I'll admit. The boards are quite big and they take up a lot of room. And I will admit that if you play this with four players, you are looking to take a bit long. It's not really suited for four. I like it with three though, broken record, three is the sweet spot as always. But with two players, this is great. You know, two player back and forth, it's really good. You know, you get a bit more confrontation with two. And even solo, you know, just have the board, roll some dice, try and get the most points building a city. Nice and simple, looks really cool, and the expansions have added some decent cards where you now not only look at the rows, but look at the columns. You have a sort of trade board, you have all sorts of other sort of ways to get points by these buildings, and granted, they're not cheap. But I think if you stick with this game, it can win you over. It's still probably not gonna raise too much higher on my list, you know, it's only dropped two places, it's hanging around this bottom end, but I still enjoy this one. It needs a bit more buzz, I feel this is a bit underrated, so Dice City, number 80. My 79 is a game that people seem to take relish in ragging on. Why? It's a great game. So simple, gateway level, I can teach this in less than 5 minutes, I can set it up in less than 2, it takes about 30 to 45 minutes to play, it's got a great app integration as well. But, and with the expansion, you've got modules to add to it in order to, you know, tweak the rules a little bit, make it a little bit more for gamers in a sense, but even with those, it's a simple game. You pick up these gem pieces and you use them to buy cards, and with the gems you get on those cards, you use them and the other gems that you're collecting to buy better cards. It's a straight up, themeless engine builder. But as engine builders go, it's quick, fast, simple, and yet has a good bit of tactical depth and strategy. And for some reason, people like to give Splendor a hard time. I don't know why. I enjoy it. 
I still enjoy it. People, I think it's all this Century Spice Road business. You know, everybody was like, oh yay, Century Spice Road replaces Splendor. I no longer need to play Splendor. Wrong, <laughs> or at least in my opinion. You know, Century Spice Road is okay, but I find that it takes too long. I mean, I can play this in half an hour. I've had games of Century Spice Road go over an hour, and it just doesn't need to take that long, especially with five players. Ugh. But, you know, and that one, you literally just push cubes. Turn cube into cube, turn cube into cube, turn cube into cube. Granted, this is just buying cards with gems, buy more cards with gems, but again, it takes a lot less time to teach and a lot more to, less time to play and set up. So, you know, I mean, tomato, tomato, take which one you want, but I personally like Splendor. You just straight up get it on the table, I can teach it so quick, and then it's like, all right, I need that card, but they've got a chance of buying it first, but maybe they're gunning for that one. I could aim high and get that card, but ah, he's gunning for that as well. Can I reach it first? Yes. Um, oh, the uh, poker chips are draining on the blue and the red. If I drain both those piles, they've got to spend because they can't get any more. Good, okay. And the expansions add even more stuff. You know, you can swap out the nobles for city tiles. You have the trading post, which I really like. Gives you special abilities if you meet certain criteria. It even speeds the game up in a sense. And uh, probably the favorite, the Orient. It adds a new set of cards for each of the three tiers and each of those tiers does different things like add to your gems, have double gems. You can scrap cards in order to get them for free. You can chain effects where you buy the top tier and it gets a free one for the next tier. You know, cool little bits like that. Granted, I don't like the strongholds on the expansion. That's the weak link, but you know, three out of four is not bad. You know, I still enjoy this game. People want to learn a new game? I'll try and bring out Splendor. If we need a filler for the night, I'll suggest Splendor. It just works. I'll even sit on the deck chair, you know, outside at work and just, you know, play a bit of Splendor now and again. It's just good, simple, fun. What can I say? My 79. Okay, now we're gonna jump from stupidly simple to really heavy. Yeah, I mean, I can't really do it without smacking my microphone. But yeah, I mean, this is a bit of a jump. We've gone from Gateway, now we're into Heavy. And we're into another of Vitalis Surder's games. I told you I had four on this list. This is the second one. And this one has a theme that I really like. It involves making wine. Yeah, that probably gives it away already. But wine, I like. Never used to like it, but I've gotten into it now. I've got a wine rack downstairs. I like it instead of cider at times. But with this one, I like Heavy Euros. Even if they take long time, if they feel streamlined and have a theme I can gravitate towards, I can easily gravitate to winemaking. It's such a great theme. And this game looks complex, and it is pretty complex, but when you get the rules down, it feels relatively intuitive. You know, you're, you've got to get the vineyards. Cool. They make the wine. Great. You go to the fair to subject the best wine. Okay, cool. These guys will give you some, you know, bonuses to it. And it kind of just makes sense. However, there is a slight caveat with... Vinyos Deluxe Edition. First, well, two caveats. One, I like this version. <laughs> the one with like stupid amount of pieces and Eagle Griffin like bolstering it up like crazy. You know? I mean, this one just looks gorgeous. It's got the great artwork by Eno Tool, who hit and miss, but you know, in this one, I think he did really well. And this one has two sets of rules. I'm stipulating that on this list is the 2016 version, the streamlined version that this one brought in. You can play this with a slightly adjusted 2010 edition, which was the original one I never got to play, but I think that's a bit too complex. You know, the advisors have all got special rules, you've got to mess around with a bank. I mean, I'm, I wanna make wine, I don't care about going to the bank and having to get loans and balance my checkbook. You wanna do that, play, play clips. But with this one, I just wanna make wine. I wanna enjoy making wine, take it to the fair and do well. Well, that's what the 2016 version does because it makes money a lot more easier to manage even though it's still equally important. And it's a heavy game, looks the business know, there's a lot of components and if I wanted to get this to the table again, I'd probably have to read the rules again because it's a little bit hard to sort of remember them all in your head. But there's already some great tutorial videos out there to play this game in many ways. So yeah, I really enjoy this. It's the third favorite Lasurda game I have. You know, it's gone down a bit because I feel that this one, theme-wise, is probably my second favorite out of all of them. But in terms of rule set, this one isn't quite as streamlined or quite as easy to get into as, you know, one of the other ones up later. So, still enjoy it. Uh, how long has this been on the list? Uh, it certainly was on last year. Vinyos has been 
No, we didn't drop by the, ah, yeah, seven places it's dropped, yeah. So this one's remained pretty steady as well. Hanging near the bottom, Vinyos Deluxe Edition, specifically 2016. My number 77 has taken a bit of a plummet, actually. 35 places, I think this was at 54, I believe. You know, it was quite a, no, 42 even. It was, it was quite high up, and now it has dropped. Not because I don't like the game. I think the game is still great. It's just more great games have come out and surpassed it, but also because as much as the expansions have made it better, it also makes it a little bit harder for me to get it to the table. Plus, despite it being a Days of Wonder game, it's thinky. It's very thinky. So it, it, it gets a lot of people sort of overwhelmed. If you play this with gateway gamers, I think they just get too overwhelmed by the choices. And if you play this with max players or slow player, oh my God, sometimes you just want to, <coughs> you really just want to like hurry up and take your turn. Because it can give you a lot of analysis paralysis. But with two players or three players, oh God, yeah, love this game. It looks so gorgeous and it is five tribes. You know, you have lots of different tribal meeples, they're spaced on this board and it's the Mancala mechanic, where you pick things up, you deposit them as you go, and then where you land, or where you drop the last one, is the one you activate. Depending on which color that was, you activate a different special ability, like assassinating other meeples, getting genies to your cause, getting a trading card, you know, resource gathering, or even just getting straight up points. The expansion adds a sixth tribe, so yeah, we've all heard that joke before, and my favorite expansion, the, oh, what was it called? Um, oh, what was it called? Sultan, Sultan Swing or something, no, that's a song. <laughs> so, but you know, it's Sultan stuff. And the idea with this one is that it gives you these little mini objective cards that you can do. So on these tiles, if you go to these big palace cities, you can meet the conditions of a particular objective card, either then or later, and it gives you some bonus points. It gives you other ways to score during the game and it, that just works for me. Having like, you know what, I could go for these tribes like I'm supposed to, but you know what, that's a good opportunity right there. I could just grab that card and it will get me some points. And I'm not the sort of person that min-maxes in this. I'll see something that I think looks good and I'll just go for it because I'm not one of those people that likes to analyze every specific scenario in a game and decide that's 10 points, that's 9.5, that's 8.75, unless he does that, in which case it's 7.75. Just take your turn! Yeah, it can rub me the wrong way when I see people do that. But this one looks gorgeous. Stunning production, it's Days of Wonder, what you need to know. And despite it being quite thinky, it's quite simple rules-wise. There's not a huge amount of rules to grasp. And it's, I wouldn't say intuitive, but it's certainly just a bit easier to get into, but pretty tricky to master. It has dropped a bit. I don't see it getting to the table as often. You know, I don't often get games to the table with two, and I can't show this to gateway gamers and free player is kind of the sweet spot, and I just haven't really got round to playing it much lately, but this will stay in my top 100 for a long time because I still really enjoy Five Tribes at number 77. Woohoo, finally, we got a new debut. Yes, something different for you folks. Now, as much as people want to rag on Splendor, I mentioned that Century Spice Road was uh, the typical one that people went, oh yeah, this replaces Splendor, I don't need it anymore. For others, this game has been the one that replaced Splendor. For me, I don't think it quite replaces it. I think it's got similarities, but it's also got differences. I'd almost akin it more similar to Century Spice Road than Splendor, and this one most certainly kicks uh, Century Spice Road to the curb for me, but it's an unsung hero again. It's underrated. It came out, it had a bit of a boring cover, it's got a boring title, but it's by the same Splendor designer, and it's just as equally great a gateway game and very entertaining whilst being easy to play, but not quite as simple to master. I need to lean over down here a bit because it's a bit down here. Here we go. Majesty for the Realm. This is underrated. It needs more love. It's very simple. You draft these people, these uh, villager cards, from a middle row, much like you do in Small World and Century Spice Road. You go along the row and the more cards you have to skip, the more little meeples you have to put down as kind of like a currency, so it's more expensive the further you go. When you take the villager, you put them in your tableau, and your tableau is the same as everyone else's in terms of the village, but it's got A and B sides, so you can keep chopping and changing the game how you see fit. And each one will trigger and get you points based on 
certain conditions, like how many brewers and millers have you got? Do you have lots of innkeepers? Um, do you have lots of, you know, knights? You know, and there's a slight attacking mechanic where if you have more knights than other people have guardsmen, you kill off some of their lesser characters, but it's easy enough to recover from them and you can mitigate it so it's not quite in your face confrontation. You know, you know it's there and you can stop people from doing it. And yeah, it's pretty straight up that, you know, you get points based on what combinations of cards you have in your village, but it's so simple. Turns are quick, I think you get what, like 12 characters in your village and then the game ends. You know, even with four players, this doesn't take long to do, but works soundly at two and three as well. Looks the part, and as I said, Mark andre it's the same guy who did Splendor. So as good a gateway game as that is, this is equally a good gateway game, and one that I think needs more love. Dice Tower looked at it briefly, I think last Christmas possibly, and that was about it. Never really heard much of this again. It's just one of those ones that's kind of flown under the radar and nobody really knows it's around until I bring it to the table and they go, Oh, this is pretty neat. Yeah, you know, nice and simple and does the trick. As I say, you can chop and change the locations to your heart's content. Probably could use an expansion at some point to add more types of villagers or maybe more variations on the locations, but it'd be a simple, cheap expansion to do without making this more complicated. It's just nice, quick, gateway level. I enjoy playing it and that's why it's new to the list at number 76. And for my number 75, we have another new debut. It's right behind me, in fact. Were you paying attention? If not, don't go and rewind the video and cheat, how dare you. No cheating, bad, wrong. But this is a racing game that I thought, you know, as, as themes go, it's not one I'm gonna go mad for, but it looks simple, it looks gateway level, and I do have a certain thing for gateway games because I like to be able to teach them to others and bring them in. And it's nice to be able to get out a game in about an hour without having to tax the brain too much when you've had a long day of work. But this one involved cycling. Yay, but I like cycling, it's all right. And I have watched a few races where they do that kind of two-person cycling, like Tour de France, well, not Tour de France, is it Tour de France? But the ones that you see going over mountains and hills and really nice locations in Spain and that, it's interesting even though I think that the um, spectators really need to learn to stay behind the lines. I mean, seriously? I don't know, control them. But this one is Flam, Flam Rouge, Flam Rouge, Flamé Rouge, <laughs> Flambe Rouge, I'm not sure entirely the pronunciation, but with this one, it's very simple. You have a track laid down. You can use a preset one or just design your own. It's got hills, it's got dips, it's got uh, narrow, well, with the expansion, you've got narrow bits, you've got like paving stones and all sorts. And the idea is, is that you have a deck of cards, everybody's got the same, and two decks in fact, one for each rider. And one can go a little bit faster, but can also go a bit slower. The other one is a little bit more in the middle, kind of average. The idea being that they should support each other. And what you do is that you pick up four cards and you look at them and decide which of your, in fact, yeah, it is two decks. And you, you grab four cards from each deck in turn and look at them and decide, all right, that rider is gonna get this card, put it face down and you repeat for the other rider. And then once everyone's done it, you simultaneously flip and everybody will have a card with a number on it, which represents the speed, how many spaces it will go on, the bike will go on the track. And the idea is, is that what you're trying to do is you want to remain sort of in the lead, but not entirely. Because when you finish moving, if you are at least, if you are just one row behind somebody else, like there's only a one row gap between you and the next rider, you shift up for free. It's called slipstream. It's what cyclists have to deal with. You've got air resistance in your face, and if you're behind someone else, you have less resistance. I think that's it, don't quote me on that, the science, but I think that's generally what it means. And the idea is, is that if you can benefit from slipstream as much as possible, it saves you, you know, having to play cards and get further around the track because you only have a finite number of cards. And once you start running out, your choices get more limited and you start getting exhausted. If you're at the very front of any particular pack, then you pick up exhaustion cards, which are just speed two, they're rubbish, but they clog up your deck. And eventually you're gonna start drawing them and eventually when you run out of all the decent cards, you're actually gonna be having nothing but exhaustion cards. So it's a great way of representing your stamina when you're cycling, but you have to, your two riders have to support each other because only one has to get past the line to finish. So you might sacrifice one rider to let the other one sprint forward. When do you sprint though? When's the best time? You gotta think as you're going round. Do I do it at the hill? Do I do it now? Always left himself open. Can I get past him now? And it's a very 
it tends to be quite a tense finish. You get some runaway leaders at times, but it's what, an hour to play this game? Nothing much. But I've had games where I've had so many people at the end, it's like, oh, they're going back and forth, and then one person just edges the front, and it's like a one or two row finish, you know, that close. It's surprisingly addictive. For a theme that I wouldn't necessarily go yay for, but it works. I can play this up to six players, I can play solo, it's, it's just a neat racing game. I didn't think I would like it as much as I did, but here it is, number 75 on my top 100. So I like it quite a bit. Take care, Flambe Rouge. Ah, here's the treat now, 74. This is the second and last returning item to the list. When I looked at this last year, I thought, how did this not get higher? I can't fathom why this didn't make my top 100. But I think what's kind of happened since last year is I've played it a lot more. This has had a lot of games since last year. And this is a result of taking it to uh, new people's houses where I'm teaching them new games. It's been a case that I've helped out at Dice Portsmouth and other charity events where, you know, you know, somebody's brought out the game, I'll help play it. And I also take it back to the parents more often and it's gone down well with the family. So I'm getting a lot more games of it. And with the this party version of the game, I'm able to chop and change how you know, what tiles come up, what cards come up, and for what is a simple drafting game, one of the staple simple drafting games, I still can't believe I didn't make my top 100 last year. Well, here it is, it's back. That is Sushi Go Party. Yes, I like it, I love this game. It's the original Sushi Go, the one in the tiny little box, that was the first thing I brought out if anyone wanted to learn drafting. Take that one. It's like five, six pounds to buy. Simple drafting game, fixed menu up to five players. Perfect. Teaches the mechanics so well. Well, this can do that as well. You can use the basic menu. It even gives you the preset of how to do that. And you could just teach it like that. But the reason I like this is because if I'm playing it with people who know the game well enough to go past the basic menu, I want to go from two to eight players and I want to chop and change the menu. Here you have got different appetizers, different specials, different... Uh, different rolls, different desserts, and you can chop and change the menu to your heart's content. Gives you some presets, you know, do you want an easy game, a, an e you know, a backstabby game, a tense game, you know, that kind of thing? Uh, do you want like a, a one where you're just collecting sets? Do you want one with two players specifically? Yeah, you can play this with two players, and it is good fun to play this two players. But yeah, apart from the fact that it's in a tin, which I'm not a big fan of tins, they're not easy to store, and it's kind of like they break easily and all that. It's a cool little game. It, my only gripe with it is that it takes a little bit of time to set this one up because you gotta get the individual cards and you gotta shuffle them all up and you gotta separate them at the end of the game. Bit of a bugbear, but like I say, if I'm willing to look past that, I get a really good drafting game in here that I can teach to all sorts of players and yet also bring gamers in who want to try out the different menu items. Granted, it's not as portable or as easy to teach, say, as the, uh, the two to five player mini card box edition. And if you can get that and you just want to sort of dabble with this one, then by all means do so. It's like a fiver to buy. But if you want to invest a little bit more money, maybe like an extra tenner, because this is only about 15, 18 quid, then I seriously suggest grabbing this. Two to eight players, different menus, great replay value for what is possibly the quintessential drafting game you should have in your collection. 74, and back on the list, and here to stay, hopefully, Sushi Go Party. Okay, for my now 73, this just dropped 30 places. And I never thought this would go to the bottom half of my top 100. I thought this was gonna stay in the top half without any problems whatsoever. However, this has a very roller coaster like effect with me. Most of the time, I love this game, but it has suffered a bit because it's modular. More modules come out for this game on a regular, well, actually, it used to be a regular basis. Now it's like, when was the last time one came out? It's like, it's like the Game of Thrones series. You know, you, you think it's regular and then you realize, wow, it was like a year and a half since the last series. I'm kind of waiting forever for this. But when you get that series, you love it. And then it's over. And then you gotta wait for the next season. It's exactly like that. This is still a solid sort of co-op time travel based game. And if you haven't got it by now, then seriously. But here we go. <sighs> time stories. Really love this co-op when the module works. <laughs> when I first played this, 
the first Arkham, um, the Arkham like mystery uh, module that you get in this, the base set, so good. It remains my favorite to this day. The original module was perfect. Then the Marcy case came out and I thought that was solid as well, even though there was a bit too much combat. Wasn't a big fan of Prophecy of Dragons. I was okay with the Egyptian one. I quite like the Arctic one. I thought that was pretty cool. You know, yeah, it's a theme we've used before, but I think the shenanigans they pulled in it were pretty cool. Uh, the sort of, what's it called? Like the Crusades era one was okay, but again, featured a bit too much combat. I quite like the one that they did recently, which was an 80s style kind of a, almost like a serial killer type setting. Uh, where you go into this house and then you go back in time and find out what actually happened to everybody in the house. It's, it's a cool one. Pretty gross and you know, gritty in places, but I felt it was quite cool, even though it didn't contribute much to this overarching plot that the modules have been trying to do. Now, this has dropped because, as I say, the modules just aren't bringing it. They're not bringing it as much as they used to. I still enjoy it, but I don't suddenly feel, yay, after the three hours. And now I sort of feel, that was good. That was good. I look forward to the next one. But they're bringing them out so rarely. They need to they need to up the frequency of these modules and they really need to start hammering at home with these modules. I fear that if the next module that comes out, the pirate one, if it doesn't bring it, I fear that people are going to get turned off this game. And it may do the same for me, you know. If, if we're just going to get meh module after meh module, this might fall off the top 100. We don't know. It's already fallen 30 places as a result. It could fall much further, but I still enjoy playing this. We have a thing, me and uh, the two lovely ladies from the game shelf, uh, check out their blog material, and us three, we get together whenever a new module comes out and we play it, as well as other games as well, but we make a day out of it. You know, I travel to their house, they travel to my house, we play this as well as other games, have a meal and just generally catch up. You know, we've been good friends before, and I look forward to those occasions. But this one, like I say, it's still a solid co-op game. It handles time travel well. I love the theme in this. I love the story. It just needs to bring it back to the height that it once was because it's starting to drift and is in danger of falling off the list if it's not too careful. But still enjoy it. Still worthy of the list. Number 70, Faree Time Stories. My number 72, I'm gonna have to travel a bit in order to go find, because it's literally at the top far corner of my collection. This is a recent addition to the collection, actually, and I thought, okay, this looks interesting. It's dice drafting, I like dice drafting. Western theme, mm, hit and miss, I'm not a big Western fan, but it looked kind of like a step above gateway level. And I thought, oh, so, you have to mitigate disasters that are gonna happen, but you can deal with them. Multiple ways to score points. Looks nice, looks pretty, and dice drafting is something I like. So I'll give it a try and see what it's all about. Turned out, I really like this game, and so do the people I've been showing it to. Now I need to grab it, it's from Tasty Minstrel Games, Pioneer Days. This one, two to four players, takes about, it says 45 to 75, more accurately it's about an hour to an hour and a half. But this one is kind of like the Oregon Trail if you turned it into a dice drafting game. You are setting out and you're trying to get victory points. <laughs> yeah, no surprise. But the idea is, is that you roll these dice and you draft them. Each one allows you to hire a townsfolk, which gives you a special ability as well as gives you a scoring opportunity at the end. You can also grab a special ability like, you know, sorry, a resource like cattle or wood or medicine. And you can also grab equipment, you know, that give you other little bonuses as well, as well as you can also use the dice for money. So you've got multi-use dice that you draft. Already that sings well with me. This is a great little tactical game where you've got to react to what dice are thrown. You've got to try and think, well, the opponent's going to want that. Maybe if I take this dice, that would be better because it screws him over and still gives me something decent. But what I quite like as well is the disasters. You have four disasters. You've got famine, you've got raids, you've got storms, and you've got disease, I believe, yes. And each one affects you in different ways. And they trigger at different times based on the dice you leave behind. And I love that in every dice drafting game where something happens because of the dice you leave. It's an extra tactical decision you have to think of, and I love it. When a dice drafting game does not do that, I, it really gets on my goat. But with this one, the dice you leave behind based on the color advances a track for the relevant disaster. When it hits the end, the disaster happens, resets, 
and they're all going and ticking at different times. You might deliberately let a disaster happen knowing it's going to affect the opponents more than you. But then you might be like, oh, I really want to take that red die, but then it's going to, we're going to get a raid if I leave that, no, sorry, we're going to get a famine if I leave that yellow dice behind. I don't have enough food. I can't deal with it. My cattle are all going to die. So it's a really cool tactical based dice drafting game. Simple to get into. The rules are not complex. Looks pretty, you know. Um, I have to admit there's a weird sort of, there's two different styles of artwork in this game and it can be a little bit glaring at times, but it's a minor nitpick. And I do wish the scoreboard was handled a lot better. I might have to look online and see if there's a better way of doing the score tracks. It's quite fiddly. But other than that, the equipment tiles are great. You know, the artwork is decent. You know, even if you've got the two extra bits, the dice are great. They look great, they look gorgeous, pretty, lots of colors. It's not even, I wouldn't call this gateway, but it's a step above gateway. It's just a good, decent dice drafter. Matthew Dunstan is the uh, designer and he's starting to come into it. You know, there's a lot of games by this guy that I quite like and we might see one or two later on the list as well. So Pioneer Days, is this the last one? Yep, this is the last new debut for this list. Staying strong, 72. And for my 71 to wrap up this video, I kind of cheated because it's at the far shelf and quite heavy. I didn't really want to have to run over there and pick it up. This one though is a climber. It's actually climbed 15 places. Used to be 86, now 71. Why is that? Mainly because it's hit the table a little bit more often, both in solo and in multiplayer. But the reason it stayed lowish is two reasons. One, as much as this does have theme, it's kind of abstract in a few places. I always make the joke in this game about why horizontal bread feeds you more than vertical bread. It's kind of odd. And there are certain other thematic disconnects here and there, especially when you consider half of this game involves you just laying out pieces, again, Tetris style. Yeah, because Vikings cared about the organization of their gear. Okay, weird. But the other thing is that this was the top choice on my top 10 games I hate to teach because you have got so many actions you have got to teach players and it's hard to even fathom what you should do in order to do well. If you're a newcomer to this game, it just blows your mind sideways and upside down. And so I'm not a big fan of teaching it. However, a lot of people I know own this game and like it as well. Therefore, I just sit in their games and let them do the teaching if they have to. But also for the most part, we tend to know what they're doing anyway. I might just need a quick refresher. It is Uri Rosenberg's giant polyomino style game. Feast for Odin. Yes, I thought this was in danger of falling off the list last year. And if I hadn't got it to the table recently, probably might have done so. But as I've managed to get it into multiplayer again, again, capped at three players, broken record, but four is just a bit too long. But two or three players, and even solo, this is a really good solo game if you want heavy Euros, by the way. But it's a solid game of worker placement where you've got to put workers on all these different actions. And it's it's great that you've got all this variety you can do with the actions, but oh my God, it makes us a bugbear to teach. And as you do these actions, you're collecting resources, you're getting gear, you're getting plunder, you're exploring other islands, you're getting ships, you're getting sheep that get pregnant. And there's actually pictures of pregnant sheep. <laughs> I'm not joking, this is the first game where you actually see the artwork of the pregnant sheep. It's kind of weird. Um, you can get cattle and get milk, you can get the sheep and get wool, you can you know, hunt and get food. And the idea is, is that you're trying to cover up your baseboard with all these different shapes of tiles and resources in order to get rid of a lot of these negative points. But of course, you get points by other means during the game. You can uh, put down occupations, a bit like in Agricola, where you can have a special power for the rest of the game or a different scoring opportunity. It's a sandbox heavy Euro. And I do love sandbox games. I love the fact that I can play this and just decide, you know what, I just fancy doing this. However, this loses out to certain other sandbox games, mainly because as much as there is a variety of stuff to do, there does seem a bit of a clear gap between certain spaces on the board being a little bit lackluster compared to others, and also certain strategies being a bit lackluster compared to others. But that aside, you don't play this often enough to exhaust every single strategy and it is cool to try different things. And in general, the whole polyomino style of covering up the spaces I really enjoy and just the fact that I do have a freedom of choice, I do like, providing I'm not the one teaching it. So let me say, a bit of extra play has seen this one climb up the list. I still really enjoy this, but unlikely to raise much further up the list unless I can somehow get the rules 
implanted in my brain so that I never have to teach it ever again. I can just regurgitate it out of a, I don't know, computer program or something. I don't know. Somebody invent that. But solid game. Don't think it really needs much in the way of expansion, apart from just maybe more tiles and that, you know, more island tiles, which it does get now and again. You know, it's already fairly complex. There's already, you know, quite a lot to think about. Like, you're, which, which way do I go? Which, which worker should I put out now? You know, it's not easy, but it does progress in a nice manner and with three or less players doesn't take too long. Four players takes way too long, I'm afraid, but three players or less, you know, you're getting this done in just over two hours, you know, two and a half tops, and that's a decent length for a heavy Euro. So, Feast for Odin, climbing up the list, you know, how many climbers have we had? One, two, three, four, five, six. So far, yeah, this is the sixth climber, you know, more games are likely to fall then they are the claim. So, you know, kudos to Feast for Odin for doing that. So that wraps up this segment of the Tap 100, my 80 to 71. 30 games down, 70 more to go. Any of your favorites turned up in the list, let me know in the comments. Are there any games that you're betting are gonna turn up later? Are there any games that you're betting have fallen off as a result? Which game do you wanna see appear on my Tap 100? Let me know in the comments. For now, hope you like the video. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done already. Check a look at the Patreon campaign if you can. Failing that, just let me know your feedback and just get in touch. I like, you know, networking and, you know, interacting with you guys. So take care. I'll see you on the next Tap 100 video. And remember, whether you like these 10 games or not, it's still only a game. See you next time, guys. Have a good day.